Bill Burr, thank you so much for coming on Under the Skin. No worries. Thank you for having me. I admire you. I'll tell you at the beginning, just so that it creates a convivial atmosphere, the equivalent of a dog showing its underbelly, but potentially its genitalia also, that I admire you. I think you're a fantastic comedian. I enjoy you very much. Does that put you at your ease or do you don't All like right. compliments? Well, I'll show you my belly too I'm and, and genitalia. I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, I think you're, yeah, you're, you're one of the rare true originals. And I've oh, wow. enjoyed your movies as much as I've joy, enjoyed like your interviews. You've had some interviews that I've, I've really liked. My, my, my friend's mum said, that's what you should do for a living is be on chat shows. And yeah. I thought that's a sort of a <laughs> insult. No, it isn't. You know something? It's a skill set that I felt went away um, where, like, back in the day when I was growing up, the big talk shows over here, for a comedian to get on a talk show, how long they were in the business, how much stage time they had, they were really, really seasoned. So when they went out there, they were relaxed. And when they told the story, it really came off as, like, effortless and that type of thing. And I just think now with the hyperspeed that, you know, I mean, it's it's still not easy to make it, but you can really just get out there. You can get yourself, I mean, the, you're, you can literally put your first set you ever did on YouTube. And yeah. theoretically, the entire world can see it. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like uh, doing panel is what we call it over here. I don't want you to, you know, being on the couch is, is sort of a lost art where I feel like um, the hosts have to work a lot more. Where back in the day, they could have somebody season and they could sort of nudge them towards funnier areas, you know, because it's always the job of the host, obviously. But now I just feel like they have to, you know, I always feel bad, you know, when I see a talk show host and they get like a guest that comes out that's not on or they're just a dud or they can't tell a story. And you just see like, you know, the heavy lifting that the host has to do. So uh, it's cool when you come on because, you know, the host's going to get the chill and kind of become part of the crowd. I sometimes forget as comedians that we uh, have a social advantage in that humor is a there's a kind of explosive, sometimes destructive power in comedy. When you see people that aren't comedians, and I mean specifically actually politicians, try to emulate it, try to be funny, try to use those social tools. It's kind of shows what a... Uh, powerful resource it can be but it's a power that's increasingly being like uh, maligned and pushed to the margins as more and more territory are designated as sacrosanct and stuff more or less and less stuff can be freely said you've resisted that in a way that i think is admirable and makes me shudder well I, to be to be honest with you the people that are trying to do that are not a very large group of people the genius of what right. they're doing is they're acting and speaking as though they are the majority. And I respect what they're doing. They're, they're going to gorilla their way in and just talk a bunch of sh stuff and act like they are the authorities. And they've, they've done their, their due diligence as far as they, un they understand how the dollar works. They understand advertising. They understand how mm. corporations have no loyalty to anybody. And if there's any little bad vibes, they're just going to walk. So they know where to apply pressure like a martial artist. They know how to get them into that rear naked choke and they're just gonna, they're gonna tap out on the artist cause it's easy cause you know, talented people they're you know, we're a dime a dozen. So they, they know they don't want the headache. So because corporations are choosing that they don't want the headache, the public perception is that they're reinforcing that this is what everybody wants and that these people are right. And this is in every one of these cases the comedian is wrong and the, the the people complaining are right. I mean, it's I don't know what's been going on over there, but like I, you know, like we had a couple where like some people in the crowd were offended by something that was said during a comedy show. Um, and of course, it was a subject that pertained to them as they let 800 other subjects go by and they're sitting there laughing, having a great time. And then all of a sudden it pokes them a little bit. And then I just love afterwards when the, the crowd member like writes out what the comic said like they're a stenographer or something and i cannot tell you the amount of shows that i had where somebody would come up to me and be like oh my god that story you told about your uncle was hilarious and i'd be like i that wasn't me that was the guy before me and then they would mess up the joke and not only could they not really remember quite what you said they didn't remember who said it and when people from the hot button groups complain though they then 
act like they have like this this Rain Man ability to know not only exactly what you said, they know what you meant more than you did. Because as you're sitting there going like, no, it's a jo- it's a joke, and then like they come at you like you you don't understand your own thoughts, you don't understand where you were coming from. It's like okay, I I can live with you misunderstood what I was saying. But this whole thing where now you're going to tell me, you're going to override me and tell me you know yeah. what I think more than I, you know, you know what my motive was more than, 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 than I do is where it, uh, it gets crazy. But I also, on another side, I have like empathy for, you know, the, these, some of these guys that they've been going after and, and the fact that women were never listened to was horrific. So it's kind of just desserts that it then goes the other way where it's like, now well, now you get to feel how we feel. You get to feel our fear and no one's going to believe you. But I don't think that, that that is then the solution because inevitably with going all the other way, then you're just going to hurt somebody innocent on the other side, which you, should nev- you shouldn't hurt somebody innocent. So I'm hoping uh, gradually it's going to adjust back to the middle. But this initial sort of finally the cork blowing off the bottle sort of makes sense as far as like the balance of nature. So hopefully in the future, you know, I think people are already way more cognizant of, 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 of that type of behavior. But over here, it's literally getting to like, now they're just going after mean people. Like I work for this person <laughs> and they weren't nice to me. And it's just like, oh my God, it's just the, the, the pressure of this business you know what I mean? I mean, you, you work on a movie or something. It's just like it's everybody's going to snap at some point when you're doing the movie. Like, how many fucking times are you going to leave that day? Something's going to happen. Like, this, this scene doesn't make any fucking sense. Just tell me what you want me to do. Like, that is going to happen when you're working 16 to 18 hour days, you know, months on end. It's just it's going to it's going to happen. And um, I don't know. You, I, don't, I don't that That's. That whole Ellen DeGeneres, she was mean to me thing. I'm just sitting there going like, uh, uh, all right, maybe. I, I mean, so she said, what, lose her show? I mean, I don't understand. And then the level of hurt that people who never even worked for her are feeling. They're acting like she yelled at them. Allegedly. I, I don't understand mm-hmm. any of it. I wonder what kind of vacuums are in people's actual lives that they need to sort of vampire off of these remote kind of traumas and incidents. A friend of mine says it's people that don't have a story. You know, they don't have their own story of their own struggle, of their own reality. Of the, I did X, Y, Z, I overcame this. This was my circumstances and I got to here. Then this went wrong. You know, like you said a minute ago, Bill, I like... Uh, if, there are so many systems of domination, some of which are indeed obviously based on sex or gender or race. There's these kind of things. That's not imaginary. That's a real thing. But what I kind of liken it to is I've been in the public eye in this country for about, I don't know, 15 years now. I remember when I sort of first got famous, there was like I used to get involved in scandals a lot. I don't know how it used to happen all the time. But I remember I used to get like a... Like the British press would say on his radio show, he said this thing and then you would get judged on that thing and the intention behind that thing. Like and frequently that weren't even what was said, let alone the intention. And now I suppose as media has become more ubiquitous, as the voices have become more sort of complex and overlapping, that that phenomena has yeah, just ex- exploded. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody has a story. I just, I don't think that people care as much as I just think it's it's entertaining the drama of it to see somebody getting in trouble. I remember in school right. somebody got in trouble. It was it, if I the, the class I hated the most, that was exciting. Oh, look at my friend getting yelled at. Oh my god, is he going to get sent down to the office? It's just <laughs> entertainment like um you know, because within those people complaining, there's people having a ball trolling the people complaining. Uh, mm-hmm. There are people in there, obviously, that are, are actually taking it um, 100% serious. But I, I think a lot of it is just, I mean, it's not no different like in sports when they get into the personal lives of the athletes, which I've never understood. I don't care what they did. If they did something terrible, that's what you got the cops for. Send them over. It goes to court. They argue it legally. And if he did something wrong, he's going to get punished. If not, he's acquitted. Like my job as a fan is I just watch the game and I root for my team. But there's other people that sort of get into, uh, you know, the soap opera, the drama of it. 
You know, I mean, if yeah. my job can become boring sometimes, as much fun as I have, I remember having a day job, the mundane stuff for that, like watching people, you know, squirming and getting in trouble is, is I just think it's just entertaining for people. So I try not to take it too personal when, you know, the times when people have like come at me, I just always think, well, you know, they don't know who I am and, you know, they might be, you know, superimposing something that's been going on in their life. It's just like, I, I just, I don't, what, what am I supposed to do? It's like, mm. When the, like when those celebrities came out and defended um, Ellen DeGeneres, then everybody just started going after the, the celebrities. Like, oh, really? This guy? This guy? I'm supposed to listen to this guy who, he, who uh, you know, hosted a talk show at SeaWorld where they drowned dolphins? You know, you're just like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. And so not to mention we're also, I think, going a little stir crazy here with this uh, – Pandemic stuff, and um, I don't know how it's working out over there, but uh, this it somehow was politicized over here. That the, right. virus, the, either, got... the virus either wears a blue or a red tie over here. I don't, I don't know how the virus gets the tie on, but somehow it's aligned yeah. politically. It got politicized over here a bit also when uh, like someone in the government like went out to a day trip to a castle saying like he was a senior aide to the prime minister went to a day trip to a castle and he was one of the engineers and masterminds behind brexit and brexit became this sort of huge uh fraction fracture in british society between the people that wanted to leave europe and the people that wanted to stay in europe and it became kind of perceived as um a kind of i guess xenophobic the people that wanted to withdraw into nationalism and metropolitan and bourgeois the ones that wanted to stay in europe and that argument re-emerged when this dude went to a, a, a castle in the north of england to test his eyesight to see if it was legitimate for him to drive an even greater distance this moment made it incendiary once again it reignited all of the brexit argument there was a minute where it all re like it was all rescinded where everyone just thought Do you know what look at this virus it's affecting everybody we're all gonna die what's the point all of us care about the same thing really family and then that happened and it was back to fuck you and like mad yeah. polemicism like it sort of it's, it uh, did get politicized it's, it's kind of depressing just yeah. how people kind of i you would hope that you know I think with our guy over here, he missed a huge opportunity to bring people together. Um, and I think if he did that, he would have cruised into a second term. And now, uh, instead of being, you know, in a fight right now. So, you know, I think, uh, I, I don't know, with, with, I really think over here, the downfall of, of a lot of just polite discourse was the, tw was the ownership of media got deregulated. And then it, they, you just open the door for somebody with billions of dollars that could buy up as much media as they wanted. And we basically have two voices now and um, that are just complete polar opposites on everything. So, you know, if I was running stuff, one of the first things I would do was try to regulate media ownership again so you could hear more voices and, and you could have sort of the whole arc as opposed to all the way over here or all the way over there because... Um, I got to be honest with you, like this virus has not been a good look for my country. I think it's actually an issue of, of national security and that we've shown that how divided and vulnerable we are over um, something that is negatively affecting all of us. Where we should have said like, hey, you know, who gives a shit about our politics? Let's all get on the same train here and go in the same direction. We'll knock this thing out. We'll do what the doctors say as opposed to what politicians are saying who are not doctors and don't have medical degrees, if we had done that, um, you know, this could have been a great thing that could have healed. As much as it's, you know, killing people, it could have actually healed people that survived it. And instead, it's, it's, it's really driving this wedge. But I don't know. I'm an, I'm an optimist because I can't. I'm, I, I, I suffer from depressive thoughts, so I can't go in. I have to always be like, no, no, no. You know, the guy in the red state and the, and the, the dude in the, in the blue state, they, they eventually we're going to come together and realize, hey, this is a beautiful nation with enough room for everybody. I, I have to think that way. Well, going I'm an optimist. Mine comes from like a sort of spiritual zeal that's come about from getting in recovery. You know, I'm a recovery from drugs and alcohol person. That sort of led me into spirituality. And that in itself has led into sort of like a kind of 
almost not religious because it's not drawn from any doctrine but a kind of a spiritual zeal that the only way we can be saved is by overcoming our own ego our own neurosis and if enough people do that then surely we will realize a kind of utopia that's become my kind of thing and i've heard you allude to and indeed directly discuss sort of therapy sometimes bill and just then you said you suffer from the old depressive thoughts yeah like negative thought and i sort of wallowed in it for a long time because that was normal And um, I don't know what happened. I just slowly got out of it. I think when I realized that I had power, um, that I was in control, like I didn't have to, like, you know, when you come into this business, it's just your hat in hand and I'll I'll do anything. I'll wash dishes. I'll I'll, I'll drive 10 states and I'll give you gas money for it. And you just, Mm -hmm. and you know, and you suck and you bomb and you don't know if you're good and all that. And then you're just so thankful to get anything. Uh, the late, great Patrice O'Neill told me a long time ago, you got to put self-worth on what it, what it is that you're doing because the club is doing you a favor in the beginning. But then after a while, once you get good, you, you're, you're, you're now paying them back by having good shows. And then there becomes the break even. Like I sucked for eight months. Then I got good, and now I've been good for a couple of years. So we're even now. So, and I am, I'm a professional opener. I'm a professional feature actor, middle act. So I should be compensated, and and with a fair amount of money. And then I just sort of, like, um, you know, the first probably half of my career, I would, you know, I was trying to be on the other side of the table, thinking, what do they want? You know, what's the look? What am I supposed to be talking about? How do I smooth the edges of my act to make it worthy of getting a sitcom? Because that seemed like the only porthole in for comedians. And it wasn't until around 99, 2000, where I just left LA and just said, you know what? I'm just, I got in this business to learn how to become a stand up. I'm going back to New York. You know, I didn't have a manager. I didn't have an agent. And I just said, the hell with it. I'm just going to go back there and I'm just going to try to become the best comedian I can. And whatever I'm supposed to get, I'm going to get. But, uh, you know, if I'm going to, you know, fall on a sword, it's going to be the one that I choose. And it was the weirdest thing. Once once I stopped caring, people st- seemed to start caring about what I was doing because I didn't care in a good way. So I was having fun and I was excited and I was trying stuff out. And I, and I think that that became sort of this new contagious thought in my head. And without me noticing, I just sort of went from the negative side over to the positive side to now I am like um, hypersensitive when I get around people that have like that vibe. And I'll try to help them out. Like, hey, you can't think that way. Don't say that out loud. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> but then there becomes that exhaustive point where it's like, Dude, I mean, I'm trying to dig you out of the hole and you're face down in it every day, digging it deeper. It's like, this is exhausting. I can't do this. So then, you know, out of self-preservation, I get away from that because I know I'm susceptible to that. So I don't have like that clinical stuff. I just had a bunch of things that happened to me when I was really young that I can look back now and, and laugh. But when I was a little kid, that was my whole world. So it was this massive thing that was sitting on me that was only this big. So... I kind of <laughs> took me half a century to undo all of that. And, uh, you know, so I got that issue, I think, a little bit under control. But then, uh, you know, I got another thousand I have to work on. I'm definitely going to run out of time before I get through all my issues. <laughs> I like that. Um, I like the the way that you describe the discovery of your own creative voice and the ability to authentically trust yourself. I've had conversations a lot with other comedians, notably Joe Rogan, and I always enjoy your performances on there, where he's talked about how he likes to keep going to like clubs and that. And I've always been a bit more like, I feel like the the, di- the dichotomy that you face there is if you go to a club where you're not on the bill, say, or if you are, you're on with other acts, then yes, you have a, you're confronting a crowd that may not like you and you've got to work hard, you've got to up your game. But <clears throat> the other side of that argument, I feel, is that it can cause you to 
uh, earlier on you described that t- tendency to try to placate or appeal to that audience whereas when you have got your own crowd when you've got your own audience when you can just like put on little gigs to perform to a couple of hundred people in order to prepare your hour or whatever it means i feel like you're in a sort of a very cozy warm bath of acceptance and that's how i get that kind of that that freedom and that authenticity is from that me when i have to go back into like a, a club environment i think oh man why do i gotta go through this again i've done my time of self-doubt <laughs> and self-loathing and being i've been had physical altercations early in my career bill i still got like literal scar on my leg from being thrown through a door like i've had like terrible terrible bombs deaths out there like any comedian has um but where do you stand on that the, like whether or not you should put yourself in environments where you're likely to be challenged versus wallowing in the sweet comfort of adulation um, I like the challenge because I, I feel like I was a better comic when I uh, had to go on stage and I had to get them to like me as opposed to now when I go into a comedy club. Um, if enough of the crowd knows me when I go on stage, then it, it's now I have to do something to lose them. Um, mm. And it's and then it's also it's hard to surprise them because they know your thing now and and. Um, so like that, that is gone. So, but I, I still think though, there's a number of big comics that I've watched have said that like that fame thing only lasts, you know, it's a good five, seven, eight minutes. And it's just kind of like, if you're not funny, like they don't give a shit what you've done. So I, I look at comedy clubs, like that's going to the gym and I make sure that I do that during the week. So, you know, on the weekend when people pay to see me, I'm at the top of my game. Like, I don't want to, like, if I was doing four shows on the weekend, I don't want the first one and a half shows to be me shaking the rust off. It's like people didn't pay to see me shaking the rust off. They're not playing to watch me practice. They're coming to see the game. So, and I think that's a very dangerous game to play because you can lose your audience. And... um, I don't know that there's anything harder in this business than trying to make it again. Hmm. It's hard enough to make it, but to, to try to make it again, because I feel like once your generation has written you off, you now got to reach back to a younger generation, you know, and they got their own bands, they got their own movies, their own comedians, and I'm going to come in, the old bald guy, hey, what's <laughs> up, everybody? Lampshade <laughs> on the head was funny when I was 20. How's this working out for you guys? It is like, who is this idiot? Um, yeah, so that is a, uh, (laughs) I guess a lot of my, uh, work ethic comes from fear of, of being like, you know, I worked so hard and did all the hell gigs and I could and did everything scratched and clawed my way up because I just, you know, I, I was never going to be the flavor of the month. This business was not looking for a balding redhead. They just, they just weren't like, yeah, you know what we're looking for in this vehicle? It just was, I was never the guy. (laughs) <laughs> but the advantage of that it was I got to develop where, you know, sometimes people that are, you know, just have the look or are really good looking, um, their road as easy as it looks is, is way harder because, you know, they didn't have like this sort of nice, easy ascent of someone that looks like me. They just did this rocket ship thing. And then all of a sudden they're way up in this altitude and they have to make all of these mature decisions of a 20, 25-year-old seasoned show business person. They have to have that confidence of, I know who I am, and this speaks to me, and they got all these people in their ear because they're making all this money, and it's really easy for them to fall all the way back down, much so than if you you just kind of went up like this, you know, you roll a little bit back down the hill. I mean, you're always doing this in your career, but someone that goes like that, it's you're stepping off a ledge, I feel. So as much as... During my 20s and 30s, I was, I was like, you know, what do I got to do? You know, because you know how it is in your head. You're like, I feel like I'm as good as that person or I'm better than that person. You start doing that shit, all of that mental torture stuff. Um, so I, I like the way that my thing worked out. And uh, I like that I look the way I look because I feel like I get to play fun things like i would i would rather play somebody's asshole dad than play the hero 
You know what I mean? Being the vehicle that the story sort of moves around with. There's all these like really interesting characters that that lead guy is kind of dealing with in a lot of movies. So, or maybe I'm just saying that because, you know, I don't have the Brad Pitt gene. <laughs> You're saying this as if you sat there like the elephant man. You look like a chiseled Yul Brynner. You're, you're growing into your looks marvellously. Although, you know, I've watched Chappelle's show. I've seen that it's it's been a journey for you to arrive yeah, at that Yeah, looking halfway decent has been a good 52-year journey for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what but does you it say doing... about your looks when you've hit your pinnacle at 52? <laughs> but like in 18 and 20, 22, the, the, the prime of your sort of, you know, I mean, I go back and I, I look at pictures of me like I um, we're doing a documentary about Patrice O'Neill. So I, I had to go through, you know, and find old photos. And I'm so old that they're like prints. So I'm trying to figure out how to scan them and all of that. And I went back and I, I just was looking. Uh, that was another thing, too, that got a little depressing. Um, all the time that had gone by. You know, how young I was. Oh, look, I had a full head of hair. I had the world by the balls. Why? Why? And I was knowing that I was in this depressive state, you know, mm. and then I finally figure it out. Now I look like this. It's sort of like one of life's funny jokes or whatever. Um, but, you know, yeah. I mean, when you get to my age, when you go back, you know, you, you, you see a lot of dead people, which is not fun. I, I literally lost a, found out, I don't know when he died. I mean, he died the day before, but I lost a great friend of mine, Wayne Previty, one of my comedians I started out with, you know, just died suddenly. And um, just the, <laughs> that's one of the, the, um, the bad things about getting older is you have to learn about grief, about that type of stuff and like what you have to do uh to sort of be able to get past it you know so i can talk about it on this thing you know yeah how are you how are you coping with that um <laughs> like this mm. so yep i'm sorry for your loss mate yeah, no, this but isn't a very British thing to do, is it? Have feelings. Well, so, yeah, this is how I deal with we it. We discourage you know, I just it. try to block it out. I, 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 I deal with it, try to do it privately. <laughs> well, I, yeah, well, look, I, I um, was an admirer of Patrice. I never knew him, but I see him in Edinburgh. And, uh, like, I didn't know your friend that you're describing now. But I do, obviously know like i'm getting older and i do know about uh, grief and suffering and letting go i know what it's like to live at this nexus of becoming a father and suddenly feeling like i've got so much to lose and that i'm feeling such powerful love that i didn't really ever want to let myself feel before because of vulnerability i didn't want to open myself up to that kind of level of pain and i do know that the price of love is ultimately grief because of the nature of right. transience and that you know what the funny thing me. i learned about being a parent was the the option of suicide is now gone <laughs> that's out <laughs> can't do suicide can't not do that, that i would you do can't. that but it's was i don't know why this is such a dark thing to say but it was always comforting to know that that was on the table <laughs> yeah it's there but, in the background yeah, it's that just button. like, all right, I know I could possibly, <laughs> and I'm obviously not advocating this before everybody gets all fucking bent out of shape, but like, once you have a kid, that's what you first go to. It's like, oh, and then what? They're not going to have a father because you, you know, at that point, you know, you no matter how much, it's a selfish thing to do. You got to ride it out. You got to ride it out and know that it's, it's going to get better. So, yeah. That that's yeah, been the, I, the most uh, other than all the great joys and all of that, the the, the <laughs> that eye opening moment. Um, I didn't realize how much I had thought about it in sort of a joking. I did a joke about it a long time ago and I, I for some reason opened my big mouth about Thanksgiving. how I was going to make a homemade pie and I was I got off the road and I came back and my wife was like, you going to make that pie. And I was like, oh, God. You know, because my crust game wasn't where it needed to be. So my first thought was <laughs> I looked at this window and it was and that was the joke. What if I just smashed my head through this window and bled out down the side of the apartment <laughs> building? Was my first thought just about making a pie. So it was um, 
And I really think a lot of those thoughts were just um, that running dialogue, monologue in my head of I hate myself and blah, 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 blah. And what that really was, was I didn't hate myself. I was just upset with the, the choices I was making because I was, I, I was in a point in my life when I was doing what other people wanted me to do because that's what I learned growing up with. Like, you know, I grew in a, a very angry, tough, rageful sort of place. So I learned, hey, do what you got to do to keep the other person happy so maybe I can get through the next 15 minutes of my life becomes like this mindset and you start making choices by what other people want rather than what you want. And then what that yeah. ends up creating is this monologue is I fucking hate myself. I hate myself. Yeah. And I started thinking like, why do I say that? And it, it took me forever to finally realize, oh, I don't like myself because I didn't want to do the X, Y, and Z. And then I started just doing what I wanted to do and telling people that, and then um, going through the hurt of them then being mad or not having a friendship anymore. And then just sitting back being like, oh wow, so our friendship existed on the level of, as long as I did what you wanted me to do, what yeah. a waste of fucking time. Other than the lesson I just learned, our friendship was yeah. because that, that's not a friendship. But when no. you're like that, it's weird. You, you, you attract those people into your lives. Like I always, I always tell, um, you know, some friends of mine that are really nice. I, I tell them, I, I go, be careful with your, your, your niceness. Like make people earn it. Because if you're just nice, you're going to attract psychos. Because nice people, because <laughs> nice people are the only ones that are going to put up with their behavior, and that's why so many times you're going to see that that in like a couple, we just see a totally toxic fucking person, and the other person's just a total mouse, male or female, and you're just looking at it like you are not getting anything you want, and this person's getting everything they want, and they're still treating you like shit, and it's just like you look at that toxic person, it's just like Jesus Christ, if you were with any sort of person that knew what they wanted you'd be divorced like nine times and instead <laughs> now you're in the middle of this 40-year relationship and everybody's sitting there going, wow how do you do it how do you do? like they have, they have this magic recipe so, i mean so, i'm not saying that all relationships like that that go that long are like that but i'm just saying that you can actually on paper you've been together for 40 years looks like wow this is this amazing relationship and it's just like no it's completely dysfunctional yeah but, but the, the, the one person is getting everything they want and the other person doesn't have the faculty to leave. So you're still together. But on pay ladies and gentlemen, they've been married 45 years. I'm body. <laughs> Get me out of here. I'm a hostage. Yeah. <laughs> I see the uh, corollary between sensitivity and intelligence when you talk about your early life, mate. It must have been hard for you in the environments that you're describing to have that kind of a sense. I see the connection between sen sensitivity and intelligence. Intelligence being the ability to spot patterns, which is so important in comedy to be able to make those kind of observations, to, to spot a pattern and then to make a, an observation about it. It's very interesting that the kind of a crucible that your childhood has provided for you, I suppose, because it, you must have had to have incubated that kind of sensitivity and built strategies that are somewhat abrasive and brusque and being able to uh, cope in kind of harsh environments and it's lovely because it's given you very beautiful inflection in your comedy your com your comedy has that sort of rasping attacking exasperated often rageful uh kind of uh tombra but evidently it's coming from a place of uh, beauty and compassion and sensitivity because anybody can Sometimes. get on stage and rant and, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and demonstrate anger but it sounds hollow and it ha if there's not if there's not an intelligence behind it if there's not a sensitivity it's very interesting how that's been cultivated in you like the, the, you know the, the, in an art like stand-up comedy it's impossible to uh, extricate the personal in a good stand-up comedian impossible to extricate the the biography from the performance it ain't even like something like music where it is immediately more abstract or or, or or you know painting or whatever in comedy it's like it's gotta be revelatory it's gotta be about coming from there even if it don't right. literally seem like it. it seems to me like um you know great like it, now the tendency for comics to speak more personally and more literally about biography is sort of i don't know i guess accepted 
But even in people like, I guess, um, Seinfeld or George Carlin, where it's more commentary or observational, there must there is biography in them, isn't there? Like, uh, you know, there, there's still a there's still a revelation of that true, authentic self that you talked about. Yeah, I think if you just watch somebody at face value, you're not going to see what you're talking about. But if you actually like sort of collectively listen to the whole thing. Like I always thought it was like, I, I've said this a million times. I even told uh, Jerry Seinfeld, I said this, I think we did comedians in cars was when his show was on the air, like everybody loved it, but they used to always say, it's a show about nothing. It's a, uh, his act is about nothing. And it's like, it's like, no, it isn't. You have to, you're not listening to him. This guy has contempt for 90% <laughs> of activities. Like he, like, he has no patience for people that are idiots. It's a, it's a mm. really streamlined, hard-lined way that he believes you should live your life. And, uh, and it's not a joke. It's like, I mean, I learned, he gave me one of the greatest pieces of advice ever where I, I, I was uh, working with him at a festival and I was going, and I saw him. It's just like, he's just like not aging. I'm like, Jesus, Jerry, you look great. I go, what are you doing? He goes, I do my shows and I just go back to the room. I go, what do you mean? He wow. goes, do your show, go back to the room. He goes, there's nothing out there. You're not missing anything. All that's out there is trouble. I go, there's nothing out there. He goes, look, you want to look like me when you're 63? Go back to the room. And I knew he was right, but I'm a stubborn bastard. So it still took me like another 18 months and... Now I see the genius of going back to the room. I remember when I first started going back to the room, the elevator ride up <laughs> to the room, I hated. I was like, oh, I want to get a drink. I'm missing out. I want to hang out. I want to joke. I want to do all of this stuff. But then as I was walking down the hall, getting to the hotel room, like the thought of the bed, getting eight hours sleep, watching a cool doc on, on Netflix, all of a sudden it was like, wait a minute, this is great. I'm not, I'm not going to eat bad in the end and order room service because I'm hammered and I need something to fill up, you know, all the alcohol that's swishing around in my stomach. And then all of a sudden I'm up at like 839 the next day. I'm going to the hotel gym and like the whole this whole other like port, this whole other like life on the road. It's like, oh, wait, it can actually be like uh, restful and relaxing. And then at the end of the day, I can I can get to do my dream, which is to go on stage and make people laugh. This is amazing. So I've been doing yeah. that since uh, 2018. You know, I just stopped booze and I still, you know, hit the cigars pretty hard for like another year. But then I, I, I sort of tapered off those things, smoking like yeah. 10 since mid-January. It's not too bad, but um, that's all right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, like I said, the whole kid thing, like, I just think that. It's just like you're hastening your demise and you have these little people that, you know, through their innocence, think you actually know things. So you have to be, <laughs> you got to be around for them. Yeah, plus for another 15 years, like, I've got children about the same age as yours. I know, congratulations on your new boy. I've got, like, two kids. They're three and two years old. And, like, I feel, and I'd like more kids. I love it. I, I want to have so many that no individual one of them has got the power to dominate my emotional life. <laughs> uh, by the end, I'm just number them. So I, I won't have, like, I won't, because at the moment they got me. I'd do anything. I sometimes cry, <laughs> like, looking at them. You know, they, they, they yeah. just pull love out of my heart. <laughs> they like, destroyed me. I'm no longer an individual. I, like, I waited till late in life. I didn't get, you know, m m married again. You know, I got married once in my 30s, but I didn't get married to, like, this marriage was, I was 41. I'm 45 now. I've got these young kids, you know. And, uh, yeah, it's a different space. It's a different space for me now. I always thought if you had a bunch of kids, it's just when they're under 10 and they still idolize you, it's like, would you even need to do stand-up anymore other than to, like, pay for all the, you know, their lives and stuff? But you came home, it's like you had this crowd of people that's going to love you more than any crowd. It's like you'd come home to, like, your own talk show. Yeah. You know, like, come into theme music and all the kids go crazy. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you have I, I don't a know. Real... I have a weird thing where I'm a big proponent of like, I always think it's cool if somebody has a bunch of kids, but then there's also the population problem. So, 
I don't know. Oh man, I, think I I'm can't done deal with that. I can't go like, I mean, listen, I'm a, I'm as principled as they come when it comes to saying stuff. But when it comes to my actual life, I'm going to do what I need to do. I'm creating yeah. that sitcom cast at home, that audience, <laughs> that coterie. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I, I feel you, mate. I feel you. Have you been, uh, what about meditation? Have you got into meditation? I was doing really well with it like 20 years ago. And I could get to that point where when I was just watching my breath, like just imagining my stomach going up and down, I could get to that mental state where all of a sudden my feet felt like they were 100 feet away Refreshed and I was in. floating. And it was amazing. Yeah, so I could get there. And then what happened was um, my brain, I got cocky going like, oh, I know how to do this. So then I would start to feel that feeling. Then my inner monologue would go, oh, here it comes. I'm going to feel like I'm start floating again. And then it would go away. And then <laughs> meditation became this really <laughs> frustrating thing. So unfortunately, I stopped. And then um, I was going to get into that, um, I almost said tantric, that transcendent, transcend whatever. But then I just got so frustrated. They just wouldn't tell you how to do it. Somebody somehow owns it. And then you got to pay them to get my chant word. And I was like, ah, f <laughs> these guys. So, don't, you, don't get angry about the chant word. I know. And it is. And I know La it would help me. So I, I know should... them people at the David Lynch Foundation. And I don't think they're going to charge you. I think they come and they teach you and your missus. And God knows she must need it to meditate as a yeah. couple. They give you the chant word or mantra as it's uh, elsewise known. Sometimes right. I reckon you should get back into it. I know that moment though. I know that moment of thinking, hold on a minute, it's coming. It's I'm transcending. I'm the new Jesus. I'm definitely going to bring about. Oh shit! Fuck! I'm back in my ego. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Or, or yeah. Whatever that is. Oh, well, it's nice to know that somebody else has that. So I can. Um, well, how I used to do it was I used to listen to the uh, the second side of that Jane's Addiction album, uh, the Ritual album. That would start off with three days. And it was sort of like intense that three days is a really intense song. But then the way that the, the it's a masterpiece of an album, the whole crescendo of that album. So I would sort of pick it up. I felt like the apex of the album, which was sort of like my day. Oh, I got to do this. And, uh, and that's sort of where my mind was. And I would be I would just sort of be listening to the music and just concentrating on my breath. And the music would sort of fade in the background and then I think it was then she did and then I forget the next one but it was really like this amazing sort of like music and then in the end um they actually Perry Farrell says good night at the end of the album so it was this perfect sort of like like per almost like an airplane perfect landing mm. and by then I would just be in like this meditative state and I would drift off into sleep and that was sort of my um, the way that I did it, as, as opposed to having like a, a, a man mantra, a mantra, however you say that word. Um, and then I, I, I don't know. And then I kind of got away from that. Tried to do it in a chair. I remember I used to try to do it in a chair. My older brother knew that I was doing it. And he would come in and start yelling. Just go, hey! Ah! Oh. And I would just sit there having to try and block him out. And that was the weirdest thing, coming out of that floating feeling and then getting in immediately into a fist fight uh was just <laughs> it was just bizarre it was really it was bizarre but i mean that's kind of the dynamic of where i lived you sort of had to do that <laughs> i mean if that doesn't say massachusetts i got into a fight while meditating <laughs> So. I feel like there's a, a devotional uh, aspect to all of us, that all of us are trying to find some essential and authentic self. That when you earlier on talked about having to curtail or not at least not express your actual sensitivity, relationships that you felt required you to be someone that you weren't at your deepest essence and how that led in turn to a kind of self-loathing. I feel like that in the way that, you know, talking about how science, Seinfeld's not very natural devotion to stand-up comedy and you know and the sort of monasticism of it going straight to bed not messing around and I heard did you hear on that documentary about the making of that sitcom he said that the reason that the show was so good is that him and Larry 
all they cared about was writing the show. They didn't give a, sh- a fuck about egos. They didn't care about anything else. He goes, he goes, you've been on a film set. Half the time is spent with people having, someone's worried about having sex. Someone's worried about ego. Someone's worried about money. And they never did that. And I feel like that, that you know, as I said to you before, that you, your uh, sensitivity plus your kind, the force of your invective is part of your, uh, it seems to me as an outsider and as a fan, uh, like part of your essential quality and that that's a sort of an expression of who you authentically actually are and i feel that all of us have to find that whether we're creative people or whether we ain't to occupy our family lives to occupy our professional lives and i feel that if we don't find that if we don't find some point of access we live in various forms of frustration various well, forms a of turning point for me was i had to realize that i was hurting people and then i had to figure out how i was hurting people because there's a lot of stuff that I say in my past specials that I, I go back and, and I just look at that and I just go, you didn't believe that. This is like like some, some of the shit that I said about women, that was me. I was the complete opposite. I was a romantic. I wanted to be married. I wanted a family. Mm. And I just threw like um, just stuff that happened to me, failures and all of that. It's that weird thing where you you're pushing away what you actually want for some mm-hmm. like whatever that defect in the human brain is. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what I was doing. So, you know, pe- and that goes back to people judging you as a comedian. It's just like, you know, it's very easy to watch that at face value and be like, oh, this guy misogynistic, hates women, blah, 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 frat boy, blah, 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 blah. And but it it actually make takes an effort to try and look, you know. I mean that's how I'm I'm watching some of this Trump shit where you just seeing like you just like he'll say something, and you like, in order to keep my sanity, I got to picture the kid that didn't get the hug, the kid that that was driven into business because his dad was good at it. And it's just like, did he want to do something else? Is his whole life an outer body experience? Or is he really this way? And, and dude, it's, it's like messing with my whole, I had this big discussion with my wife last night talking about the irresponsibility of religion with, with a higher power. Where go they on. go like, oh, people have freedom of choice. So it's just like, so when a serial killer is born, that's not on God at all. Like, whoa, leaned a little too far this way. On that. Like, that's not on him at all. He gets to walk away from all of that. And if you watch, like, all of these nature videos and just how the whole thing is set up that, you know, the big eat the little and, and how there's certain animals that their only way of survival, like rabbits, no fucking defense whatsoever. <laughs> Their only defense that they get is that they can fuck so much and have so many of them that you can't wipe them out. But the second you're a rabbit, you know I'm going to get killed by a snake, eaten by a coyote, ripped apart by wild dogs. That is their fucking existence, and they don't hurt anybody. Their sex must be so frantic and anxious and fueled by, I'm finished, the snake's going to come any moment. I know, I've looking got over your shoulder what? as you're Jesus. <laughs> there's some people that like that kind of thing and it's just like and in those behaviors i see human behavior and what the hell we do to each other and um you know if you watch this stuff on some serial killers you hear about their childhood and then there's a point where you want to rescue them before they become the adult monster and it's yeah. and then i just sit there and go like so this dude was beaten every day, he was molested, he was locked in a closet and all that. As a child, you'd go and rescue him. Then he goes out in the world and does what he does, what his parents taught him. And then they sort of divorce his childhood and then just go, this person is, a, a, you're just supposed to be, a, that person's a monster, evil incarnate. He chose to be evil and blah, 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 blah. And then there's also that weird dichotomy where you then it's like, well, now you're an adult. And you know what being hurt is. You need. You shouldn't be doing that. So you got to hold them responsible. Like, I, 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 I can't even like wrap my head around, like that type of stuff. Did my audio just drop out on this thing? No, you're here. Did. You're here. I'm listening. I'm no, here. I got it. I got it. Gonna... Oh, there's an English, very brilliant English comedian called Simon Munnery who had a very good joke on that. 
He said like 90% of people that are sexually assaulted as a child will grow up to become sexual offenders. The solution is obvious. Incarcerate the victims. And like, like, and I feel though that when sort of coming down with that, uh, the, to the serial killer thing, the fact that we find it abhorrent is evidence of a kind of, that there is a certainty to morality. In a universe where there is no, I'm not saying God, but no conceptualization of good, why not be a serial killer? I'm not saying morality is impossible without God. I'm saying that our awareness of goodness suggests that we have some intuitive understanding of goodness. In the natural world, I think it becomes different when you regard them as interconnected ecosystems rather than individuals. And and that's something that comes up in what you said about the biography of a serial killer how is the individual even responsible at all if that individual is the recipient of all this negativity then they go on it's almost like it's only the fact that we see ourselves as enshrined by a bag of skin rather than as interconnected beings that makes culpability possible at all i'm not saying people aren't responsible for their negative actions or for their crimes or there shouldn't be consequences for bad actions i'm saying in looking for a solution it's pretty evident that if you grow up in a community or environment that has lots of negativity in it you are likely to go out and enact that in uh, that uh, negativity elsewhere so like in order to look for a solution i think whether that's on an individual or a cultural level that we have to i feel personally drop below my own when you said that thing before about all of the hatred and the anger and the rage i feel and and like suicide in fact you know i feel like we have to learn to drop below what we can as we do in meditation drop below the thing that you consider to be the self this matrix of thoughts and ideas which isn't really the self at all according to a lot of meditative philosophy but rather a kind of neurological static that's just taking place and if you can learn to observe it and let it pass you don't have to engage in the kind of actions of it so like i don't think of a, a serial killer as a I liked work because <laughs> i engage in the static well yeah, uh, yeah and the, the audio the, did drop out but I'll, i got 50 minutes of this stuff so i'll just we can just use the audio for this right here off the computer if that's all right yeah because i was just unraveling the eye you was trying to say there is no god i was trying to say there is a god we were at an important junction he has to be response he or she it they whatever has to be responsible for creating, uh, you know, a, a, the, the, the flawed human being. Yeah. Here's my deal. My deal is 35. Okay. By the time you're 35 years of age, mm-hmm. you, you, you have to be looking at yourself as a flawed person and you need to start trying, you know, to undo what it is that you're doing. So my deal with the serial killer is, <laughs> I'll give you all those people you killed up till 35. <laughs> 35, you got to be sitting there going, wait a minute. I'm repeating what has been happening to me or whatever. Um, obviously, serial killer is an extreme example. I'm, I just, or maybe I'm superimposing. Maybe 35 is too old. It's just because 35 is where I started to get it. That like, um, you know, things you're saying, things that you're doing, the way you're behaving is, 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 um, is not good and, and you're hurting people and you need to you need to not you need to work on this and you're you're recreating what you hated in your childhood what you didn't want this this intense angry environment um mm-hmm. i mean it took me till i was like 30 to even realize i was angry <laughs> so that's how like not in touch with whatever the hell i was doing was um you know, was was I don't know, was rolling around in my head or whatever. So that's for yeah, of course. You're just okay, so pay you for a therapy session on this one. No way, no way. It's uh, amazing to talk to you. Although I was just about to me, I'm a person who digs like Jungian therapy and all that stuff around mythology. And I was thinking about like now that you are uh, freed from the tyranny of poverty, the kind of and from the tyranny of being people that you are not. The hobbies that you found are like drumming, like with all of its uh, percussion and rhythm and the basic sort of rhythms of life, and flying helicopters and the transcendent and the escapes. I can see the appetites that are in you that are reaching out into expression as well as uh, like the, the brilliance of your art form. Hey, mate, uh, are you doing this for some promotion? Do we need to promote either the Judd Apatow film or F is for Family? I did a uh, movie for Judd Apatow. I've seen it. Yeah, King of Staten Island. So it's going to be available for digital download 
and you know old school people if you want to get it on blu-ray you can literally have a physical copy of it they have all this deleted scenes and there's a ton of improv that happened on that um that said uh especially with a lot of the actors that i worked with that played the firemen was there so were some of them real firemen and was it like doing stuff i watched it i really loved it i loved your performance in it i love steve buscemi that must have been good working with him was it Oh yeah, he was the best, um, and he also was a firefighter for a number of years before he became an actor. So, um, other than people who were still on the job, there was like four people that were still on the job um, that we were acting with. Like, if they weren't available to look at, I would look at Steve because he still had all that muscle memory, just the way he walked around the truck, the way he leaned on it and stuff. Like, this guy had been in a firehouse, you could tell. So. Um, you know, guys that work in firehouses are, are, you know, generally speaking, are really funny. And they also are going to tell you if you came off looking like an actor or whatever. So I was definitely leaning on all of those guys to say, you know, there's literally like literally putting the ladder up on the side of the building. There's a way to do it. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, as opposed so you don't look like two dads trying to get something out of the gutter. You know what I mean? You're supposed to look like a pro. It's the most efficient, safe way. You know how far away from the building it's supposed to be. And, and mm-hmm. like... You know, we ran through that like, you know, half a dozen times before we shot it. And uh, I think I was working with Raphael that day and I just kept saying, it, Does, am I doing it right? He's like, doing it right, you're doing it right. But they're also like super positive, so. Uh, Did you give yourself a good torturing for not having a proper job during that? Like, oh, I'm an actor, there are these firefighters, who am I? <laughs> Uh, I think it was, I didn't really, I, I'm kind of past that point in my career. I think if you're working 16 to 18 hours a day, I think you do have a job. Um, but it was more, um, we visited the firehouse where Pete Davidson's dad served, literally the firehouse that he drove out of on 9-11 and wow. never returned. And um, they had all this 9-11 memorabilia um, in, in, the, in the firehouse and John Sorrentino, who worked at the firehouse during that time, also acted in the movie. He uh, took us through the whole story. And he was just like, all right. He goes, enough time has passed where I think I can get through this story. And I just remembered listening to that. And then that was just that feeling of like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, how am I going to do this justice? And that, But I also believe that's also why they adjusted the story to have Pete's dad die in a hotel fire movie Pete's dad. Mm. Um, so the weight of 9-11, you know, in, 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 in all of that. And plus, you know, I, I think that people that want to revisit that awful day should do it on their own time rather than dumping it on them. You know what I mean? So I, I think it was a very, very smart move by Judd and Pete to take it out of there and um, focus more on the emotions of loss rather than uh, the political ideology of that day and on all on the religious stuff and all the stuff, all the stuff that happened on that terrible day. So, um, yeah, but it was yeah, we, amazing. We, and I got to work with incredible actors, Marissa Tomei. All, I mean, it was, it was amazing. Oh, yeah, she was, uh, that was like, yeah, it was like a two and a half month acting class. And she had everything from the stuff you learn in the very beginning to 30 years of experience, just all at her fingertips. Yeah. And each time she would do it differently, it was just, you know, it was, yeah. I was hanging on for dear life. Yeah, 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 yeah. She, yeah, she got the equivalent of knowing the angle to put the ladder at, but in acting terms. Well, it was an, a, a really amazing film and you're really, really brilliant in it. I really, really enjoyed it. Bill, um, thank you, mate. We've done 60 minutes of this conversation. It's been really, really beautiful to talk to you. As I said at the beginning, yeah, we've done it. We've served it. We're free men now. I really um, I admire you a great deal as a comedian, as a man. Congratulations uh, on your journey and on your family and on overcoming all the things you've overcome. And I uh, look forward to continuing. Hey, same, to uh, same with you. you I've, I've watched, followed your story, and it seems like you had a lot tougher road than me. So uh, okay, guys like yeah, you, yeah. if I see you coming out of it, that gives me hope. So thank you. You're beautiful to say that. Thank you, Bill Burr. All right. Happy quarantine. And I hope uh, <laughs> at some point we can talk face to face. Without wearing love that. scuba diving masks or whatever the hell the future is going to look like. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, mate. All right, we'll see you.